No spiritual impulse has been more maligned and misunderstood than the so-called spiritual tradition of Gnosticism. The Dutch scholar Gilles Crispel, in his 1990 essay entitled Gnosis and Culture, identifies certain figures throughout history who have cemented, in our collective imagination, a caricature of Gnostic ideas. The idea of the so-called Gnostics as a heretical sect are due to a number of heresiologists who wrote polemical treatises against rival Christian and Jewish schools of thought. Included within their number are Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Epiphanius, Origen, and Clement of Alexandria. Ironically, Clement of Alexandria referred to himself as a true Gnostic. The term itself, as we have come to understand it, is an entirely modern construct. Although there were certain Jews from Alexandria who called themselves Gnostics, literally knowers, the origins of the Gnostic impulse can be at least dated to the teachings of Empedocles. In 1966, a congress on the origins of Gnosticism were held at Messina, Italy, and there the attending scholars made a distinction between Gnosticism, which is not attested to in late antiquity, and what is called Gnosis. Gnosticism is therefore a modern term. The definition arising from the Congress is as follows. Quote, a coherent series of characteristics that can be summarized in the idea of a divine spark in man deriving from the divine realm, fallen into this world of fate, birth, and death, and needing to be awakened by the divine counterpart of the self in order to be finally reintegrated. The idea is fundamentally that the soul is enslaved by fate and must therefore wake up from its deep sleep. Much of our current misunderstandings of the Gnostic perspective can be attributed to the scholar Hans Jonas, born 1903 and died in 1993, who asserted that Gnostics had a deeply anti-cosmic perspective and saw the world as fundamentally evil, only fit for escape or liberation. This mistaken assertion of cosmic pessimism deeply influenced later academic treatments of Gnostic movements, and to this day color the rhetorical strategies of orthodox believers to delegitimate the truth claims of Gnostic belief systems. Hans Jonas was deeply influenced by the French existentialists and 19th century German nihilists. He also happened to be a devoted student of Heidegger when he was younger. These philosophical influences very much colored his perspective and interpretation of the Gnostic mentality. Gilles Quispel identifies two other scholars who were responsible for promulgating an untrue and biased understanding of Gnostics during the 20th century. The first, lesser known gentleman was a Swiss by the name of Denis de Rougemont, who in 1939 published a widely influential book called L'Amour et l'Occident. In this work, he argued that the inheritors of the Gnostic tradition in medieval Europe were the Cathars, who resided in southern France, and who can be accused of promulgating the following depravities. Some members, firstly, chose not to marry due to the fact that they were in essence medieval Manichaeans who rejected the institution of marriage outright. And secondly, troubadour poetry which emerged from this region, which celebrated courtly love, the idea of a knight wooing a lady, who may not have been his wife, mind you, therefore encouraging adultery and amorous affairs, and erroneously equating troubadour poetry with Catharism of which there is absolutely no evidence. Classicists are not immune to this mischaracterization of Gnosticism either. In her work entitled Cosmology and Fate in Gnosticism and Greco-Roman Antiquity, Nicola Lewis identifies certain influential scholars who attributed this notion of cosmic pessimism to the Gnostics. Gilbert Murray projected a lot of his emotions when he characterized the entire Roman zeitgeist as marked by a pervasive cosmic pessimism. He detected, quote, 
an intensifying of certain spiritual emotions, an increase of sensitiveness, a failure of nerve. This opened the doors to pathologizing Roman and late Roman religious experiences. Lewis tells us that this was, quote, based on the conviction that empire induced its citizens a marked tendency towards superstition and irrationalism. Another scholar named Arthur Nock conducted, quote, psychological case studies of mental instability in historical figures of the 3rd and 2nd centuries AD, and included in this list was Apuleius of Madeira, the famed author of the Golden Ass, who, by the way, also happened to be a practicing magician. No one deserves more ire, however, than the scholar Dodds, who is responsible for writing The Greeks and the Irrational, a deeply biased work that promulgated 19th century materialist rationalist views on the irrational and the mystical. His belief was that the devaluation of the cosmos, arising from a desire to bolster their sense of security in a hateful and materially insecure world, was a result of Oriental or Babylonian influences. Perhaps a scholar more influential in the modern discourse, identified by Quispel, is Eric Vogelin, of whose works I find very interesting many years ago. In fact, I have a number of his volumes on the shelf. Vogelin, who was a refugee from Austria under Nazi domination, moved to the United States to teach political science in Louisiana State University, the University of Munich, and the Hoover Institution of Stanford University. He had studied much of the Gnostic literature available at the time, primarily relying on secondary sources, and of course was heavily influenced by the work and flawed opinions of Hans Jonas. At this point, let me cite directly from Quispel's essay. Quote, According to him, the essence of Gnosis is that Gnostics want to destroy the world and humanity and murder God. This tendency could also be found in the millenarian, revolutionary groups of Middle Ages, and in such figures as Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche. Vogelin applied his insights to political science. Marxists, national socialists, and liberals, he declared, all want to destroy, or at least change, the world. Greek thinkers like Plato and Aristotle, on the other hand, argue that order should be maintained in the state because it reflects the immutable laws of cosmic order. While I have certain sympathies with Vogelin with regard to these views of modern, so-called secular millenarian tendencies, Vogelin's ultimate thesis was based on Johannes Jonas's mistaken notion that Gnostics rejected the world. As we will discuss in this video, this view of the Gnostics did not differ from many so-called proto-Orthodox Christians, Neoplatonic theurgists, and Catholics. In the introduction to Volume 5 of Vogelin's magnum opus, Modernity Without Restraint, Klaus von Dung writes, quote, Although the Gnosticism thesis could be maintained with respect to its essential core, it seemed to be necessary, with respect to the historical phenomena, to distinguish, for instance, Hermeticism from Gnosticism, and above all, Apocalypticism, as expressed in Jewish and Christian visions and millenarian, chialistic, and messianic movements. Quite a few phenomena that Vogelin dealt with under the heading of Gnosticism are usually attributed to the apocalyptic tradition. The author of the introduction continues, If Vogelin recognized the complexity of the situation, why did he not retract some of his statements and offer a new reading of the field of spiritual deformations? He answers his own question. Vogelin's habits of scholarly work rarely motivated him to revisit complete projects. In addition, he was not interested in publishing the volumes of his history of political ideas in later years, since it demanded the integration of new scholarship in the various periods of Western history. Here it becomes obvious that Vogelin himself abandoned his unnuanced and historically inaccurate critique of Gnostic movements and their general applicability to modern political movements. Yet many Christian commentators on YouTube continue to champion Vogelin's outdated assessment of Gnosticism as being some sort of debased spirituality, giving birth to socialist utopias which seek to immanentize the eschaton, as he famously stated. 
This includes, of course, tr transhumanism. Let me outline a worldview, and you can decide for yourself whether these are the words of a Gnostic. Death is not inevitable. Through human intelligence and willpower, we can use technology and science to finally accomplish the divine task of literally resurrecting the dead. In this sense, Christ's resurrection prefigures an active task for all people to infuse spirit into matter and to revivify our ancestors until we manage to bring the first couple, Adam and Eve, back into bodily existence. How would this be done? Of course, we would use organ transplants, genetic engineering, space travel, and the recreation of the individual from the minutest particle. We should also abstain from eating all meat and become vegetarians, and in doing so, wrest control away from the evolutionary course of nature so that we could evolve apart from her and become more plant-like through our ability to take nourishment from the air and sunlight. It may come as a surprise that these views were actually held by a devout Russian Orthodox believer of the 19th century named Nikolai Fedorovich Fyodorov. As we will show later in this video, the language expressing enslavement to the world of materiality and matter and the desire to escape do not differ between so-called heretical Gnostics and proto-Christians. In fact, the Apostle Paul himself is extremely radical in his views on the world we currently inhabit. There is a modern resurgence of orthodoxy among the youth. Paul Kingsnorth, Jonathan Pajot, and others have performed an admirable service for the revival of orthodox Christianity among a new generation of spiritual seekers, in a modern world full of malaise, confusion, and empty materialism. I do not decry their achievements. But commitment to truths underlying the structure of church doctrine and canon must be preserved and expressed, otherwise we'd simply be repeating history and its prejudices and getting no closer to a fuller expression of the workings of the Holy Spirit. However, their insistence on the mischaracterization of Gnostic traditions is an affront to spiritual and religious truths and refuses to dispel ignorance through assertion of only partial, approved truths. Even pagans like Survive the Jive are not immune to distancing themselves from Gnostics and characterizing them casually as world-denying cosmic pessimists, in opposition to the world and life-affirming pagans. Astrology also comes into consideration here, as many of these 19th to 20th century scholars implicitly adopted much of their Christian upbringing to bear in their works regarding superstition and irrationality in a declining empire. The basic assumption is that any astrologically determined fatalism expressed by Romans of late antiquity was by nature proof of intellectual or religious ignorance or inspired by a morbid sense of enslavement in the world, ultimately caused by what they termed an age of anxiety. Let us go through a few points to dispute the claims of cosmic pessimism among the so-called Gnostics relying heavily on Lewis's monograph. First, the Gnostics were not strict determinists. The idea of astral fatalism suggests that we are all bound by our actions, and that we are determined through the activities of the stars in a way that we cannot be real agents in the world with a real will and choice, and this would of course nullify all ethical responsibility. The word aimarmene, adopted from the Stoics, is used to describe this cosmic compulsion or fate. The word aimarmene is only used in six of the 52 Nag Hammadi tractates. Furthermore, not a single Stoic fragment exists suggesting that aimarmene was considered a constraining or enslaving force. Fate itself was considered an aspect or part of the divine mind or nous dios. Fate was not something separable from God, and the old argument between fate and providence was not yet firmly entrenched. In fact, originally, pronoia, or providence, and aimarmene, or fate, were actually considered aspects of the same divine universal will, of which the human will was, of course, a part. Both universal and human wills led towards the good, essentially because there is no distinction between the cosmos and the human soul. 
It was in fact Cleanthes who was the first to distinguish pronoia from aimarmene, and he did so in order to try to remove the sense of moral responsibility from things that were outside human control, like fate and providence. In the Apocryphon of John, aimarmene is mentioned along with antimimum numa, which were installed by the archontic powers to enslave humanity and to rob it of its spiritual knowledge. It is through sexual intercourse that sins, distractions, and spiritual blindness are brought into the world, leaving humanity in a state of ignorance from, quote, the God of truth. As Lewis remarks, fate can lead people in wrong directions through the antimimum numa, aka the counterfeit spirit. But the Apocryphon of John suggests that people still have the power to make good or bad choices. There is a way in which the power of the counterfeit spirit can itself become replaced by the salvific power of pronoia. This shedding of spiritual ignorance is a remembering, a remembering of what one already knew prior to the descent into matter. It is a form of knowing. It is gnosis. As Carl Gustav Jung would agree, Gnosis is the antidote to fate. Number two, matter can be viewed as evil, but not the cosmos. The idea of cosmic pessimism has been attributed to the Middle Platonist Numenius, and Numenius himself had an incredibly influential impact on the Chaldean oracles, where matter was equated to a tomb or a prison, the notion of sema as prison and soma as body. The sound similarity of the two words was played upon to equate them in a meaningful way. In Chaldean theology, the soul acquires a garment as it descends through the planetary spheres and eventually becomes fully encased and under the dominion of fate. And so in this instance, Aymarmene is associated with physis, or the process of generation in nature. Ultimately, daimones were responsible for the processes of nature and therefore to escape was to combat the daimones through their stranglehold on the human being through the passions, not through astral or planetary powers beyond the moon. Aymarmene acted in a manner that was identical with pronoia and followed the divine principles of law and stability. They were essentially two sides of the same coin and our own level of knowledge and remembering dictated whether we were under the sway of providence or fate, both of which were created through God's ascent. Another tractate entitled The Origin of the World introduced what is called the Eros myth, which states that Pronoia initiated the process of generation by introducing sexual desire into the cosmos, of course, sexual desire brings about the generative process, which eventually leads to death. But in this tractate, there is a separation between the higher pranoia and the lower pranoia. The lower aspect of pranoia works together with Aymarmene to produce the offspring of Eve. Lewis clarifies that, quote, this subjection the author did not perceive as necessarily malevolent. Aymarmene's influence was part of the harmony and oikonomia of the cosmos and was connected with the principle of righteousness. All this happened according to the providence of the Archigenitor. Despite the ignorance of the Archons, the author believed humans would eventually come to possess Gnosis. Furthermore, the separation of pranoia into a higher level and a lower level that collaborated with fate effectively localizes the problem of evil to a specific spatio-temporal realm, as opposed to solving the problem of evil by positing that the entire cosmos is evil. If you really wanted to strawman Gnostic cosmologies, you can point perhaps to the most cosmically pessimistic tractate in the Nag Hammadi library, which would be the Gospel of Judas and then proceed to uniformly apply its cosmological viewpoint to all the other 51 tractates. But that would be unfair. Point 3. Astrological Slavery as Polemical Device It should not come as any surprise to most listeners that the struggle for legitimacy was rampant among the soon-to-be-solidifying Christian Church. The idea of astral enslavement became a rhetorical means by which specific religious communities were able to exclude differing views. 
it came to the point where this trope of astrological enslavement was only attributed to those who held heterodox views. This isn't distinctly a Christian polemical strategy. In fact, many religious communities operate using the same tools to differ themselves from the rest of the uninitiated or ignorant. The idea of exclusivity can be manifest in the cult of Mithras, where it was Mithras alone who possessed the power to rotate the cosmic axis, and by doing so, fundamentally alter the effects of fate on the initiate. A similar notion can be found in the Egyptian cult of Isis, where the savior goddess could free the supplicants from fate. In fact, she was called Mistress of Fate, who creates destiny, or Mistress of Life, ruler of fate and destiny. In the Christian context, Tatian adopted the expression to be born again from Paul in the Gospel of John. The implication is that upon baptism, or new birth, you are literally cleansed of Aymarmene and granted a new horoscope or nativity. This act separates you from those still condemned to astrological fate. 4. Paul introduced the idea of an enslaving cosmos. In the Gnostic tractate entitled Hypostasis of the Archons, which describes hostile cosmic entities who are bent on the destruction of mankind, the tractate begins with a gesture of acknowledgement to Paul, quote, the great apostle. It is Paul who believes that through baptism, the Christian is free both morally and ontologically. The idea is that one is both free in the world and from the astral forces that exist from without the world. This idea of Paul's was so pervasive that Valentinian Theodotos is quoted as saying, before baptism, fate is real, but after it, the astrologies are no longer right. Lewis rightly identifies Paul's implicit assumption if the cosmic order is established by God and that the archontic powers that hold sway over human beings are originally present in this cosmos and can be averted through baptism, then the order of the cosmos itself in its original state is still authored and ordained by God. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, the law keeps humankind under restraint. It is contingent and limited and is appointed through angels. But law contains a curse, and its adherents are enslaved. The scholar Reiche is quoted as saying, Paul actually considers all the non-Christian world, both Jewish and heathen, to be subject to the law or elements of the universe. These elements or stoicheia can easily be traced back into history to the four rhizomata of Empedocles' teachings, the four roots of fire, air, water, and earth, which are simultaneously gods or daimons, which have now transmogrified into enslaving entities of demonic force in Paul's worldview. Paul's assessment of the law is not that God ordained it, but that the angels did, and this implicit meaning in Paul's view were picked up by some Gnostic circles to understand that the law is a demonic enslaving force directly in opposition to God's rule. After all, as Lewis remarks, quote, to serve the law is to be unable to perceive the truth, since as Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Paul asserts that the true freedom is unattainable and that one must choose between which power to serve. In Romans 3.24, rather than the freedom from celestial powers, Paul speaks of redemption, a polytrosis, which literally translates to loosening or freeing of the individual from forces opposed to it. Therefore, in order to escape these forces which act on the body, one must first die to both the body and the law. Once baptism has been accomplished, Christ snatches the individual from, quote, the body of death, and the enslavement of the astral destiny of the person is wiped away. 5. Proto-Orthodox and some Gnostics use the same language to describe the escape from fate. Here is a lengthy quote from Lewis. 
In summary, a wide swath of Christians in the second century drew freely upon discourses of freedom and rebirth when conceptualizing the profound changes available to an individual at baptism. Far from contingent, ritual act affecting only the social status of an individual in relation to group or society, baptism was thought to have implications that restructured an individual's existential relationship to the cosmos. A neophyte could recognize, post-baptism, that she or he now existed in a state of freedom, having been wrested from the cosmic bondage that had previously enslaved her or him. Although the binary enslavement freedom seems to express the cosmic pessimism of so-called Gnosticism, according to key figures such as Hans Jonas, in actual fact we find the same language featured prominently in virtually all the proto-Orthodox writers of the second century. Indeed, from the extant writings of Justin Martyr, we would be hard-pressed to find a more striking example of cosmic pessimism and the conviction that Jesus Christ, through baptism, had vanquished fate. Finally, we can end this video by highlighting a quote from the Apocryphon of John utilized by Lewis to provide the antidote to the false belief that Gnostic cosmology was pessimistic or nihilistic. Bring your attention to the rising sun of hope and profundity expressed by the author when he writes the following words. Bitter tears he wiped from himself, and he said, Who is it that calls my name? And from where has this hope come to me, while I am in the chains of the prison? Take care for now.